Burnett here. Today's Taste Life Nutrition Radio and podcast streaming live on KUHSDenver.com where I neglected to turn all of my cameras on. So here we go. All right. Now we're going. So we are excited this morning to have on Dr. Mana Senbi, um, who is a specialist in women's health and specifically midlife women's health, which I'm like, Yes, this is all about me. So we're going to talk about me today. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for being here. We're grateful to have you on and joining us. I am delighted to be here, ready to get into our conversation. Yes, me too. I'm so excited. I have, uh, I have some fun questions for you. Well, at least I think I have fun questions for you. So um, anyway, but as always, we start the show with gratitude. Gratitude can change the world. I truly believe that. I think it's a it's important for us to wake up grateful for whatever it is that we are and can be grateful for, and then going to bed for those things as well. Um, in, in gratitude, I don't know, I think you sleep better when you go to bed in gratitude. I, um, I like to, my, my gratitude are kind of like my prayers um, also, so it's sort of a little bit of both. But anyway, what are you grateful for today? Uh, I am grateful for life in general. Life yeah. is good. Yeah. Life is full. Life is good. Friends and family and good times right. and um, great work. Uh, everything is good. <laughs> I'm good. grateful for all of it. Yeah, yeah I'm with you. Um, yeah, life is good. I, I'm gonna, there are a couple of things I'm grateful for this morning. One we talked about, so I uh, jumped on the highway this morning and got pulled over. That was awesome. <laughs> but grateful for not have had a ticket in however many years it's been because he just let me off with warning. So super grateful for that. That, w that was uh, always always exciting start to the morning. Um, I will, I'm super grateful too though uh, for the ability to collaborate with other practitioners, with doctors, with those who are in both functional medicine, but also those who are in conventional medicine who are open to the broader world of medicine, which is really beautiful. So I don't know if you know this, um, Dr. Senby, but I am collaborating with and helping an immunologist to open up a wellness clinic uh, locally here, which has been uh, an undertaking for sure, but it's been a lot of fun. Uh, we've had to push back the opening date. It was going to be this Monday, but now it's going to be next Monday. Um, and he is reconnected on epigenetics, right? That's his thing. That's my thing. And it's this beautiful thing. Epigenetics is it's our God-given gift of free will, in my opinion. I love it so much. Anyway, so those are the things that I'm grateful for. I'm grateful to be able to expand what I can provide and those who are out there who also want to expand their own knowledge and capabilities outside of what they already know. Um, so it's good stuff, anyway. Yeah, yeah, it's really great. Yes, it's really wonderful when conventionally trained doctors are also doing things mm -hmm. in a slightly different way from how they were trained. Agreed. And kind of going into the whole comprehensive overview, holistic view of medicine, that's wonderful. Agreed, agreed. So let's do this. Let's jump into our conversation, but starting with you. You know, so give us a little bit of background on you, where you come from, what you're about, what excites you, what motivates you, what brought you here today. You know, so often, you know, I think especially those of us who are in healthcare in some capacity, often it's due to our story. And so, what's your story? Yes, I have a story. <laughs> I have a story. <laughs> Many stories combined to make one big story. Yeah, so exactly. I am a, yeah, so I came to the U.S. as an immigrant, and um, I was advised by my undergrad advisor that I should do a degree in accounting because I will always have a job. Oh. And as an immigrant, that's the most important thing. They always have a job, be able to pay your bills. So I did that. And then I went on into the world of accounting and finance for 12 years. And um, I enjoyed it, it was good. But after my kids were born, they were diagnosed with a special needs and my beloved pediatrician told me there was nothing she could do for us. And that was my first brush with medicine saying they don't have answers. Mm. They don't have answers and uh, that was a difficult spot to be in. And there were other challenges in the family where 
um, we weren't getting the help that we needed from medicine. So that kind of opened my eyes to that there's got to be other answers, other ways to get solutions and the help that we need. And if I'm in that situation, then there are probably many others also in the same boat. So that started my switch of careers and a six year journey back to school for, um, back to grad school for naturopathic and functional medicine. And then when I finished that, I um, had all these experiences where um, it was, um, I came across so many doctors, well I'm skipping over a little piece, which is that I was diagnosed with breast cancer not too long after that. Oh. And then when I was diagnosed, I, um, I learned again how, of course, medicine is doing great things, and especially when somebody is diagnosed with cancer, there's um, a lot of therapies that we can um, benefit from, but the doctors, are many doctors, uh, still have the same information about menopause and hormones. Um, that's like more than 20 years old. They haven't mm -hmm. updated their information, mm -hmm. which is very strange because these are people I admire and respect in many ways. Mm -hmm and still they haven't updated their information and that's a disservice to all of us, Agreed. right? Mm -hmm. So I found that even if the answers exist in the world, the person who we expect that she will have those answers for us and will guide us may not have those. Mm -hmm. So it just always keeps coming back to we need to do our own work, we need to be our own champions, we shouldn't take no for an answer and we should continue to look out for solutions that are going to be best best fits for us, for our families, and then I just extended that to my community, my work. Became really passionate about midlife health, about menopause, about brain health. All these are experiences that I had myself in my personal life. And so there is nothing more that gets your fire going, right? Like I have seen yeah. this. Yeah. I know what the experience is yeah. like. If I've had this experience, other women are having this experience. Mm -hmm. That's what got me all fired up for being so passionate about this stuff. Awesome. I love it so much. Yes, and thank you for that. I have a question. It's a little, well, I think it's on topic, but I'm really curious about your opinion on breast cancer being estrogen, and I know not all of them, but estrogen mediated, right? And so there is the, uh, the treatment and the opinions today that breast cancer, you have to lower estrogen, you have to stop estrogen altogether, right? Um, but I believe there's more to it than that. And if you, if that's something that you're comfortable talking about, what your thoughts are on, on that specifically? Yeah, so breast cancer, as you mentioned, can be, there are many different subtypes of mm -hmm. breast cancer, right? There are estrogen positive, progesterone positive, HER2 negative or HER2 positive. So you can be all positive, all negative, or a combination thereof. And then, of course, there are other types as well that are much more um, invasive and malignant. So we have to be very careful about making sure we know the profile of the cancer that um, we or our loved one has. And um, yes, there, this is an area of a considerable debate mm -hmm. about if you have hormone positive cancer, um, should you stop your uh, hormone therapy? And uh, what are the, how do we know what is the right thing to do? And there are divergent opinions on this. On one hand, we are very clear that we do not want to give hormone therapy to people that have hormone positive cancer. On, on the other hand, there are oncologists, breast oncologists who feel comfortable um, prescribing low dose hormones to people that have um, hormone positive cancer or have a history of hormone positive cancer and just monitoring them much more closely, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a whole spectrum and how it should be decided for each person is very, very individual, right? And uh, your entire risk benefit profile for you, your family history, and also considering all the benefits that hormones give us in light of your current or previous diagnosis of breast cancer. So this is a discussion that needs to be had, but I just, the point that I wanna make here is that there is no blanket answer that it's a no, right? right? right. It, this is something to be discussed. This is something to be researched. And I 
I do know that um, more and more research is being done on this topic. Mm -hmm. But um, over the next few years, hopefully we will have more clarity. But this has become such a lightning rod topic that it's hard to perhaps do a research to the extent that we want. And ideally, we would have this research already, but I think it's still underway. Mm -hmm. The bottom line is there shouldn't be a blanket no. It should be discussed with your doctor and discussed with somebody who's comfortable talking to you about it, who, doesn't, who hasn't completely closed their mind to it. Right. Agreed. And I think that what often um, is missed are all of the other factors that can have the potential leading to this situation in the first place, right? Sure, genetics, epigenetics can play a role in it, but what, what is it, and we may not always know, but we want to dig as deep as we can to understand what are the to what's the toxic load, right? What's your lifestyle look like? What's your stress look like? Right, stress is huge, and I believe specifically in breast cancer, stress is really huge. Um, you know, food, sleep. I mean, we can go on and on with all of these lifestyle factors that can play a role in pushing disease. And so, dig. You know, find somebody who's going to dig for you and with you. I mean, that's what I always want to do. People may come to me and I'll say, I don't have the answers, but I'm certainly going to do my best to help you dig and we'll just see what we can find and, and do, go, go from there, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, there are, mm -hmm. there are a number of specialists out there, but you do have to look for them and you have to find them. And the best thing is to go through referral. Ask your friends who they have seen, friends of friends, however you can get this information. Yeah, agreed. All right, so let's talk about what we were supposed to talk about. I always like, just whatever comes to my mind, like let's talk about it because these are, these are important things to understand. You know. Cancer is a scary, scary diagnosis, but um, has the ability to be managed in, for the most part. So look for those who can help you. Now, as far as moving through life, for us as women, as we go through these changes and start to go through perimenopause, I, let's, let's maybe just start there. Um, you know, a lot of these questions that I'm gonna ask, I believe I'm, are coming from my own perspective. Um, in my own experiences, I'm grateful to not have a lot of symptoms, but the things that so many of us, when you say this on your website, I have been on this soapbox for a little while, and I think we talked about this a little bit early on, but we don't know anything about our bodies. As, as women, we don't talk about this stuff. We don't talk about um, what, what it could look like as we move through these changes, when we start to move through these changes, and you know, People can start moving through peri and moving into menopause, perimenopause, sorry, 40s, yes, even earlier potentially? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, um, so the average age of menopause is 51, which means you have your last period at about 50. And perimenopause can start as early as 10 years before that. Mm -hmm. And since 50 is the average age, there are many half the women are going through menopause before 50. Mm -hmm. So. Typically, you would find you're going through perimenopause in your early 40s, early to mid 40s, but there are many women who are going through perimenopause in their late 30s, right? Mm -hmm. They're young moms, they have uh, very young kids, maybe even toddlers, and they're going through these hormonal changes in their body. So it's really important to know what to look out for, right? Because women at this time have so much on their plate that when they are burnt out or have no interest in sex or, um, are anxious or irritable or depressed, we can attribute them to everything else in our life except the hormonal changes. Because mm -hmm. we are not educated, we don't know that this is a really important contributor to all of these symptoms. So the first thing to do is, first of all, get comfortable with our own bodies. Get yes. comfortable, know our own bodies, and be comfortable talking to each other, to our friends, our sisters, our mothers, um, our daughters about our bodies and the changes that our bodies go through, right? We mm -hmm. certainly talk about puberty. There's no doubt about that because we have to prepare our daughters, right? We certainly talk about pregnancy, right? Mm -hmm. We don't talk about perimenopause. Mm -hmm. And those are the three big hormonal shifts that happen in each woman's body. And you can argue that perimenopause is probably the one um, that is the most important to talk about be because most of most women will live 40% of their life in menopause. Mm -hmm. 
So it's important to know what to expect and how best to prepare. Right? Mm, yeah. If we dig our head in the sand, it's not going to help. It's not going to help. So it's really important to get comfortable with the with the the various stages of life that we are all going to go through and we are going through, right? Mm -hmm. um, how many women do you talk to about their experience of menopause, right? Mm -hmm. You have a show, so I'm guessing you talk to more people than the average woman about perimenopause and menopause, yeah. but the average woman does not have this experience of talking even to her close friends about this topic. Mm. It is still a taboo topic. Even amongst women, we don't want to talk about it because the perception is that we are losing something and we are um, we don't want to do that. We don't want mm -hmm. to lose our youth. We don't want mm -hmm. to lose our um, you know our energy and our uh, fertility, and all of that is happening. So we're kind of turning our face away from that. Mm -hmm. Or what we instead need to do is actually turn towards it and see what is really happening. Yeah. So we can be better prepared. Yeah. yeah. So what are symptoms? So you, 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 you hit on this. And I have a a friend of mine in a friend of mine in mind right now. And one of those things so I wanted to talk about the symptoms, go into a little bit of detail with the symptoms, but one of the things that you taught that you hit on was depression. Are do you, can you can you give a little more detail for my own sake and for anybody else who's listening about what that can look like? And then of course other symptoms as well, but what that can look like and how we can move through if that's, if it's, horm if our depression is hormonal, not psychological, right? There, I mean, it is, but there's, there's a deeper issue to it. Yeah. And that's what, the, that's what we need to find out. When you're in a state of depression, Where's your motivation, right? It's hard to learn, it's hard to search, it's hard to want to get out of your funk. So I just want to dig into that a little bit because it's sort of right top of mind. Yeah, so um, I think we have to distinguish this question to two things. One is women who have a history of depression, right? And then they have treated it and perhaps it's in remission or it's still ongoing and then they find the way that they're managing it, either with medication or any other therapy, is that going through perimenopause can, can worsen the situation, right? So that's mm -hmm. one situation, mm -hmm. somebody who has a history of uh, depression and how should that be dealt with. The other is somebody who does not have a history of depression and is feeling these symptoms for the first time when during their perimenopause. Uh, it is important to know that we have receptors for estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone in pretty much every organ system of our body, mm -hmm. and a ton of them in the brain, yeah. right? So when these hormones begin to run low, we experience symptoms globally in our body, in all organ systems. It varies from person to person. Um, who has susceptibility to feel more symptoms in which organ system. Mm -hmm. Somebody may feel more um, genitourinary symptoms. They may have more um, sexual symptoms like um, painful sex mm -hmm. or uh, recurrent UTIs. Others may have more of a depression, more of a sadness, more irritability, so mental, emotional symptoms. Mm -hmm. So it's really, and it's really common. This is common. Mm -hmm. So it's important to know, first of all, do you have a history of a condition like a depression or is it new? And even if you do have a history, is it worsening, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really important to keep close tabs on how you're feeling and be able to delineate if this experience is additional to your um, general mental emotional state. And if it is, then super important to get with a practitioner who is menopause literate and um, do a whole symptom inventory with them, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, perhaps do some labs with them. Doing labs during perimenopause is tricky because the hormones can be so up and down. So one day if you test, they can come back in the mm -hmm. completely normal range. And if you test the very next day, it could be totally out of range, mm -hmm. very low. Yeah. So you have to be careful which hormones you test at which time. Um, but there is a way to address this. So if you work with the right practitioner, if you keep closed tabs on your symptoms, 
Um, there is a way to address this, whether you do um, supplementary, you know, you start supplementing with some herbal supplements or some nutrition, which can be helpful mm -hmm. in getting you back into balance, mm -hmm. or just eating more estrogenic, progesterogenic foods um, that can naturally boost those hormones in your body, or perhaps doing hormone replacement therapy, depending on what is right for you yeah. and what are the levels in your body and what is the extent of your symptoms. There's so much I want to talk about right now. So let's start, <laughs> let's start with let's start with labs, because what what typically happens in conventional medicine, I, I what I've seen in practice anyway, um, which is not not bad, but can we do more? So it's doing serum level hormones, and it's usually done just when you're at the doctor. So it's on any random day. And so, especially if you're not having periods and you're going through perimenopause, your hormones are gonna be all over the place, right? So just doing them on a day and doing serum levels may not be really give you, I mean, you said this, but just kind of expanding on it a little bit, you know, may not give you really what it is that you need as far as understanding your body, your hormones, where you are then I'm curious what your thoughts are. So I'm so there are urine tests that we can do um, that I do a lot and I'll do month long urine tests. Um, you know, they're just you know, dry urine testing. Anyway, that can give us an indication of what's going on, especially for younger women who are like, you wanna get pregnant, you're tired of what you wanna see where your, your hormones are, it's called cycle mapping, right? You can do that. So what I'm curious about and what I believe to be the case is doing cycle mapping for women going through perimenopause or to see where you are in your cycle is also beneficial. Would you agree with that? So cycle mapping is one way. Okay. Cycle mapping was one way, and now there are newer labs okay. that are doing cycle mapping um, with uh, more updated uh, kinds of metabolites that they're testing for. Okay. And so, yes, you can do the dried urine cycle mapping, and there are a couple other new companies that I have worked with, with which you can test. So for women that are still cycling, and if they have a regular cycle, if they still have a 28-day cycle or a 30-day cycle, as long as it's still regular in the number of days, we can estimate when the progesterone should peak, and we generally try to test in that date range. Mm -hmm. So if it's a 28-day cycle, we'll generally test between days 19 to 21. Right. But many women in perimenopause are not having a regular cycle. It's varying from one cycle to the next. So we cannot predict what day it is that your progesterone is peaking, and it's hard for us to then in those cases, you can either do cycle mapping or you can, what I prefer to go by is, certainly cycle mapping gives us a lot of information. We can kind of see how their hormones are um, fluctuating through the month, right? Mm -hmm. But the most important thing is symptoms. A patient's report of their own symptoms mm -hmm. is the most important. And then the other thing I might do is check their FSH levels. Yep. They're follicle-stimulating hormone levels. So as, as we approach menopause, the level of this hormone begins to rise in our body, right? And this is a more um, reliable predictor of how close you're getting, right, in addition to the symptoms. And I think cycle mapping is a good accessory to test also. Sure. So you can use any of these ways, a combination, one or all of them, to confirm where somebody is and then suggest what would be the right thing for them. Awesome, very good. Um, I did have another question, but it left me. So let's talk about, let's talk about, I mean, this is, okay. So I wanna talk about brain health and I wanna talk about it, in, it. For me specifically, there are a lot of things to talk about, but when it comes to our potential for dementia and Alzheimer's, right? And so there's, you know, I'm kind of just jumping straight in, but what I, what is, you know, there are certain variants that can increase our risk factor for Alzheimer's, right? And so I'm an APOE44, which is pretty not great. <laughs> But the beautiful thing about understanding your body and understanding your labs and understanding your genetics and your variants and all these things is, you know, when we're looking at your specific variants, 
when we know what they are, we know how to mitigate them. And that's, you know, this is, this is again, going back to epigenetics and, and the, how this, you know, this is free will to the highest degree is I can make the decisions to the best of my ability to mitigate any risk, at least as much as possible mitigate the risk that this is something that happens for me, right? I study it, I research it, I look into it. I find people who know more than I do, which is a lot of people, and helps me to do the best that I can for my own risk factors. And so I believe that to be the case for everyone. Not everybody wants to know this, but I think it's important to know when, when we can. So when we're looking at moving through perimenopause, not into menopause, where the potential for these signs of dementia, these signs of Alzheimer's can start to peak their nasty little head when really is, it really is more hormonal dysfunction or dysregulation as opposed to true dementia, Alzheimer's. Um, would you agree with that? And feel free to expand. <laughs> yes, so this is a big topic. Um, ApoE44 simply means that you need to be more on top of your um, making sure you are doing everything you can in a more proactive way. Actually, everybody should be proactive, but certainly ApoE44, um, there is data that suggests it needs to be more, so no wine, no alcohol. Mm -hmm. Staying on top of your food. Um, so the, it's true that women are diagnosed with dementia at twice the rate that men are, and more and more research is showing that for, men, for many women, these symptoms can begin around menopause with the loss of hormones, right? But I would say that hormones are a pretty big piece of this picture that can lead to dementia, but there are other pieces as well, mm -hmm. right? There's your metabolic health, there's your blood sugar regulation, yep. there is your heart health, right? There is inflammation in the body, there is gut health, there are toxins, mm -hmm. there are infections, so all these things are factors as well. Um, hormones, which we call like um, trophic factors, things that are important for our body and um, our organ systems to continue to regenerate in our body and stay healthy. So there are things like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA, pregnenolone, mm -hmm. vitamin D, B12, iron, adequate levels of iron, adequate levels of many trace minerals. So all of these are important, right? right. And, um, and a whole lot of, lot of other factors that I just mentioned. Um, but for women, I would say, and even for men, we wanna make sure that their levels are optimal too. For women though, because such a drastic thing happens at midlife that we lose our hormones. And then um, the average age at which a woman is diagnosed with um, dementia is 72. We know that changes in the brain begin to occur 20 to 30 years before the diagnosis is made. And it's, to me, it's clear what's happening in a woman's body 20 to 30 years before they're 72. It's mm -hmm. perimenopause mm -hmm. and menopause. Mm -hmm. So it's really important for us to be educated on what are the risk factors, what are the various risk factors that lead to a decrease in our cognitive ability that lead to a diagnosis of dementia and then do everything we can today starting today so that we don't become a statistic right mm -hmm. so yes so hormones are a critical very important piece but not the whole picture right agreed i was um had a conversation yesterday at an event where you know, he's not a, he's not anybody who's in, you know, the health field in any capacity, but it was interesting. He said that he determined, you know, 20 years ago, so say, or 30 years ago, whatever it was. So he's probably 65, give or take, to change his diet, change his lifestyle, mitigate his own risk factors. And he started doing it when his friends started calling him, calling him a, uh, you know, the, the tree hugger or the granola and they were making fun of him <laughs> and you know and he is now healthy and doing well and all of his friends who are making fun of him for eating well and doing all of these things 
are the ones who are struggling, who are having heart attacks and strokes and, you know, dealing with disease and dysfunction and all of these things. There's something that, well, and this was years ago, thankfully we're, we're, we're moving into a place where there's more awareness around, you know, what it is that is more healthful. There's still so much confusion about food. Food is so basic, but people are so confused about what's right or wrong. But things that we're not mitigating that are really important risk factors. Stress. Stress is so big, right? I mean, stress is like at the top, but what we don't under, what, what we don't usually think about is we have stress, but inflammation creates stress, which is gonna create more inflammation. Disease creates stress, which is gonna create more disease. Um, lifestyle, you know, toxins create stress, which is gonna create more issues, right? So we can go on and on. It's not just about work stress, relational stress, financial stress, which those are big, big stressors, but understanding this this um, downward spiral that happens when we are dealing with these other physical stressors as well and then if we're not addressing the infection the toxic load we don't know it's there we don't realize it's there it's pretty much always there you know addressing those things that are creating just that you know I see it as kind of that little uh, grass fire that just sits there and just perpetuates and it spreads and spreads and spreads it's still stress and it's still gonna cause symptoms leading to disease. And so mitigating these risk factors early on is, like you said, 20 and 30 and 40 years ahead of time or starting today, you know, just start now. So we can, you know, as my conversation went yesterday, it's not about how long we can live. Yes, we want to live as long as, I mean, I think most of us wanna live as long as we can, but it's about living fully and well and upright and not in a wheelchair and fully functioning cognitive abilities until we're no longer here because that's gonna happen, it's just part of life, right? But living well for as long as we're here, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we call this foundations of health, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Stress management, stress, sleep, mm -hmm. uh, exercise, um, fresh air, good water, good quality food, mm -hmm. these are foundations of health. And if yeah. we don't have these in place, um, there will be disease, mm -hmm. right? Of course, genetics, we don't know. Genetics is something that, you know, you come preloaded with that, and then the rest of it, you can figure out how you wanna do. So genetics and epigenetics, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so all these foundations of health are critical for epigenetics. They are the pillars of epigenetics. This is how we can control um, our diet and lifestyle and our sleep habits. So you mentioned stress, and uh, the main stress hormone in our body is cortisol. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about hormone optimization, we're not just talking about the sex hormone, but also your stress hormone, and also your metabolic hormone, which is insulin. Mm -hmm. So all the hormones need to be optimized for you to be in an optimal mm -hmm. state of health. Mm -hmm. And sleep is a big part of it, regular exercise is a big part of it, um, learning to manage your stress, mm -hmm. learning to manage stress, letting, letting things go, letting things roll off is mm -hmm. such an important thing mm -hmm. uh, that can benefit all of us. Yeah, fully agree. Um, I, I work every day, doesn't always happen, but for my own practice, you know, as, as I integrate my, my, my gratitude, it's my prayer time. Um, it's my also, I, I need to get back to like truly meditating. One of my favorite things um, about prayer time and meditation time that, I, you know, it's a practice, right? And there was a reason for me to talk about this, but is what, what I believe to be the case, and this isn't my thought, this came from someone else in a discussion we were having, but that prayer time is talking, is me talking to God. And then that meditation time is that time to allow him to talk to me, which I'm hoping he's talking to me all the time, but, it's quieting the body, it's quieting the brain. Your brain is not gonna just stop working. It's always gonna go, you know, so it is a practice to learn how to quiet it, and when you come out of it, go right back into it, right? It's, it's a practice. Every day, it's, it's a practice. Instead of what I hear a lot, whether it's friends, family, clients, is I can't meditate, I can't be still, my mind just keeps going. Of course it does, so does mine. <laughs> yeah. So, 
But those are the things that literally can change our nervous system and allow our brains to calm, but allow our gut to calm, you know, allow us to digest our food properly. These, these things that are essential to life that are so basic. Another way that I think of, of calming the nervous system and, and, and it can be sort of a type of meditation, going for a walk, walking barefoot in your grass, getting out in the sun, that's my favorite. And that's that's what gets me truly meditating. Is if I can if I leave, this is what gets me outside is leaving my computer. I see the sun out. Like I'm gonna go. I'm gonna lay in the sun, and that's my time to take in the warmth and take in this amazing thing that God gave us. Please don't be afraid of the sun, and listen, and be quiet and be still. It's my very favorite thing. I haven't been able to do it in a couple of days, and I need to. <laughs> Nice. That's really nice. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. You know, if meditation is difficult, try something else. Try journaling. Yeah. yeah. It's just a minute of quiet time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, there's no prescription. We'll see what works best for you. Mm -hmm. I always, when I work with people, I tell them, I ask them, what is their level of stress on a scale of 1 to 10? Mm -hmm. And if it's a 7 or 8, then I'll say, what can you do to bring it down to a 6 or a 7? Just trying to move it by one or two points. One or two points mm -hmm. consistently. Consistently, if you're trying to move it down just by one or two points, that is enough. Mm -hmm. you know, I would never suggest, like, you know, if it's a seven or eight or 10, that you work on bringing it to a one or two. Right. Yeah. Virtually impossible. Right. And that, in fact, saying that creates more stress. Yes. You have to see, like, okay, just make small changes mm -hmm. yeah. to get you there. Yeah. There is a, a client I had uh, years ago who, you know, we also, I think there's an understanding that when you have kids, it can be hard to meditate. It can be hard to be still and be quiet. So, you know, you can do things like getting up a little bit earlier. But what she would do is she would go into her bathroom and take a shower, obviously close the door, and that and she, that she would just sit in the shower and be still. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's, it really is finding what works for you. You know, having your quiet place in the house where nobody's allowed and all of the candles and the stuff it's you know that sounds nice but it's usually not the way <laughs> it's not going to work for most people so you find what it is that is going to bring you the most goodness and the most calm and and the the ability to do it regularly right it's going to be different for everyone yeah, yeah. yes yes <laughs> so I think um, and what I was going to ask about a little while ago when it slipped my mind was probably what most people are curious about, which is hormone replacement therapy. And I want to be very clear because I want to talk about both of these. I want to talk about regular pharmaceutical hormone replacement therapy, and then I want to talk about bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. and. It's so interesting, you know, in my mind, and I know this happens a lot, I think those of us who are practitioners, we assume everybody already knows what bioidentical hormone replacement therapy is, and it's not true. Um, I talk to people all the time, and they're like, I don't know, the doctor just put me on it. Okay, so let's find out what it is, and let's figure out what we need to do with that. Um, and, and it can be, I, I think it can be done well, it can also be done very not well. So let's let's start with just regular everyday pharmaceutical replacement therapy. What your thoughts are, and yeah, I think what are your thoughts? So um, there are different ways in which you can get hormones into your body. Different ways of administration. Um, there is so let's start with estrogen. Estrogen comes in oral form, which is still the most prescribed kind of estrogen in the country. And that is not bioidentical, right? But there are other forms like patches, which are available in regular pharmacies, in CVS, Walmart, Walgreens, wherever. Those are bioidentical. So um, what research has shown that the application of estrogen through the skin is more beneficial than taking it orally. So whether you take it through a patch, which is available through most pharmacies, pretty much all pharmacies, and it is bioidentical, and insurance will mostly pay for it, which is great. Um, and of course, then there are these compounding pharmacies that create creams 
right, that can have different availing levels of estrogen and um, estradiol or estriol in them. And you can control a little bit more about how much uh, you need and if you need to vary those levels. But the patch, which is conventionally available in the pharmacies, is bioidentical. And the difference between bioidentical and non-bioidentical is that the molecule which is in the bioidentical hormones is identical to what we find in our body. It is still made in a lab. It is made in a lab, but it is identical to the hormones that are found in the body. The oral estrogen that we take is a conjugated equine estrogen that is not identical to what is found in our body. And I don't prescribe the oral estrogen. And if people that come to me are on oral estrogen, I make a case for why they should switch to a skin application, whether it is a patch or cream. For progesterone, you can apply it through the skin or take it orally. If you take it orally, uh, what happens is when it goes through your gut, through the liver, it creates these metabolites that are very calming. So it's almost like taking an anti-anxiety medication without taking an anti-anxiety medication. Mm -hmm. Progesterone can help women sleep, especially if you take it last thing at night. It can help you relax, calm down, and have a really nice full long sleep. It can also be applied uh, through the skin, but uh, the sleep benefits are less so if you do that. And then testosterone is a totally different thing. So, so just basically the difference is simply what is found in our body and then the molecules that are the same as that, that's bioidentical. Great. And it is um, preferred. If I prefer to use bioidentical and we can get estrogen and progesterone, which is bioidentical at regular pharmacies, which is a great thing. Mm -hmm. And many insurances will actually cover. What is your opinion on using estrogen whether estrol or estradiol alone. So when I say that without progesterone, do you have an opinion on that? I do have an opinion on that. Most doctors will say if you have a uterus, you should be taking progesterone as well. And I agree, if you do have a uterus, you should be taking progesterone, not just unopposed estrogen, because then you're building up the lining of the uterus and then you're not taking care of it. So it's important if you have a uterus to be taking progesterone and estrogen. If you do not have a uterus, I still think there are many, many, many benefits to taking progesterone. It's not only a female hormone, but it's also a neurosteroid. We need progesterone for our brain. We need progesterone for the sleep benefits. We need progesterone for many other benefits other than just the health of the uterus. So I always suggest, I always prescribe the two <clears throat> hormones in combination. I was told by a practitioner not too long ago that she believes that all women under 40, so, I mean, not young women probably, but if you're under 40, you should be taking 100 milligrams of progesterone. Over 40, you should be taking 200 milligrams of progesterone. What are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. So I don't have a set rule or recommendation like that. Mm -hmm. It really depends from person to person. Yeah. There are some women in my practice that are in their early 50s and they are still cycling regularly. Mm -hmm. And I don't see a need to prescribe progesterone to them because they do not, they're not presenting with any symptoms that make me feel like the withdrawal of uh, progesterone towards the end of the period is having a significant impact on them. Symptoms tell me a lot more than labs will, right? Mm -hmm. Symptoms tell me a whole lot. Yeah. So I don't think there is a need for a blanket recommendation like that. Mm -hmm. It depends. Yeah. I have other patients that are in their early 40s that are on progesterone for half the cycle, mm -hmm. okay, but not every day. And I start them on 50 milligrams. Okay. I don't start at 100, depending mm -hmm. on... so. I really have to see mm -hmm. where each individual is and what is their need, right? And then we titrate depending on how well they're doing. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole point of personalized medicine. Right. It's like we are not just saying you have this problem, take that. Mm -hmm. We're saying, okay, these are the symptoms you're presenting. 
This is a recommended way to go about it, but let's try and really cater to your symptoms and make sure we come up with a solution that is totally personalized for you. Right. Um, some women need the higher estrogen, the 200. Some women don't need the higher, um, sorry, the higher progesterone. Mm -hmm. Some women don't need the higher progesterone. Um, it is also, it can take some time to get to the right levels of the hormones mm -hmm. for women. Because sometimes when you start a woman on uh, hormones and she hasn't been on any for a few years after menopause, she can have some spotting, she can have some bleeding. We need to keep close um, tabs on those symptoms. We may ne need to reduce the dosage of the estrogen, we may need to increase progesterone. It all depends. So in the first few months when somebody starts hormone replacement, it's very important to stay in close touch with your practitioner so that your levels can be really optimized to where your body needs them. And um, whether it's 50 or 100 or 200 or even higher, sometimes you need higher. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on your situation and your situation can change from time to time. Mm -hmm. If you're under high periods of stress, you're probably gonna need more of those hormones. Mm -hmm. So transiently, you may need more and then you come back when the stress goes away, then you can come down to your normal regular levels. Very good. I love that. I want to ask you a question kind of going back to the depression. Is there, do you, do you know, do you see the one or both of the hormones that if they're dysregulated being more of a, of a, uh, an issue with depression or do you think it's just a combo and just depends on the person? So the first thing that I'd like to say is that, you know, the re there may be a reason that you are depressed. There may be situations, there may be conditions, there may be work, relationship, all kinds of things, right? There, there, there may be a reason for you to be depressed, or there may not be a reason, depending on, it can vary right. from person to person. Yeah. So what I would say is that um, what hormones do, in my experience, with all the women that I've been working with is that you know, they obviously externally don't change any situations or circumstances in their life, but what they do is that they give our resilience back. Mm -hmm. They give us our ability to deal with stuff back, mm -hmm. right? So that's one thing. The second is like, which hormone is, um, you're asking me, which hormone is more um, helpful if there are symptoms of depression? Mm -hmm. I would say bringing estrogen and progesterone in balance for you mm -hmm. is critical, mm -hmm. right? And then testing to see, do you need testosterone? A very important hormone for women as well. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of those three figuring out, you know, and then we wanna make sure there are no imbalances, there are no nutritional imbalances that can lead mm -hmm. to symptoms of depression, making sure you have enough B12, enough D, enough, um, the right uh, ratios of um, copper and zinc and other trace minerals that we need to have in our body. So, uh, so yes, I would say that it's a combination that needs to be uh, titrated to you specifically. Yeah, two things with that. Um, you're talking about the nutrients. So many people are on prescription pharmaceuticals, whatever that looks like, and they often can deplete our nutrients. And so is that leading to symptoms, right? If you're if you don't have the nutrition, if you don't if you're not if you're not utilizing your nutrition from your foods, if you're not supplementing what's being depleted, then it can lead to all kinds of symptoms, you know, including depression, but including hormonal dysregulation, right? And and then you know there are so many other things that we can talk about, but understanding that taking pharmaceutical drugs can well, and I think that even, I, I would imagine that even things like ibuprofen, right? All of these things are going to deplete you. So know that, be aware of what you're taking, and then do you then need to support your liver function? Do you need to bring in other nutrients? Do you need to, you know, you know take good supplements? I, I love supplements. I supplement therapeutically. My goal is for people to not have to be on long-term supplements, but... We've got it, you know, exactly what you said. It is always dependent upon the person, but having the awareness that whatever it is that's going on in your life and what, what you're doing has the potential of doing 
uh, you just need to balance that, right? Right. So I'm not saying you shouldn't take drugs, right? They're, they have their time and their place, but know what's going on with them. Um, and with that being said, you sort of segue beautifully into testosterone. I would love for you to talk a little bit about testosterone when it's appropriate, why it's appropriate, is it appropriate? Uh, and uh, because I think it's, I think the whole testosterone thing is fascinating. I think that we've got to be really careful. We've got to be very careful with all hormones, right? But uh, it is a fascinating topic. So I'd love your opinion. So the first thing I want to say is, you know, this thing about testosterone being the male hormone and it's called testosterone because it's produced by the testes and all that stuff. It's like, you know, as uh, humans, we've done a lot of disservice by choosing names and words that label things a certain way. And then for generations to come, we think that why it's a male hormone. Well, we produce testosterone in the body first. Women produce testosterone first, mm -hmm. and then we convert it to estrogen, mm -hmm. right? When we are young, the amount of testosterone in our bodies is higher than estrogen, okay? And then, of course, over time, it goes lesser. And then when the ovaries shut down production of these hormones, the adrenal glands continue to produce testosterone for the rest of our lives. Um, in the light of modern living, it may not be enough. It may not be enough. So what, how I work with women is uh, I first get their estrogen and progesterone balanced, and I like to have them in a balanced state of those hormones for about three months. Then I check their symptoms to see how are they doing, right? Uh, what is their energy level? What is their ability to work out and build muscle? How is their sex life, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I will test their levels for testosterone. And if there is need based on the symptoms and the testing, then I will stop them on a low dose, mm -hmm. right? And I'll continue continual monitoring to see what are your symptoms. Do you notice changes? If you need to go up, mm -hmm. you do. But then there is a sweet spot for most women where they get to and they say, okay, I feel great. I feel great in my energy. I enjoy my workouts. I see I can build muscle again. Because mm -hmm. remember, as you get older, sarcopenia, muscle loss, mm -hmm. is a real concern. Yep. And you want to make sure, especially for women, you want to make sure we are building our muscle mm -hmm. to the extent that we can. So that is my take on testosterone. Now, it's really important to know that the urogenital area is packed with testosterone receptors, mm -hmm. packed. For sexual health, we need testosterone. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, but not all women, it really depends. It really depends, like not all women have troublesome symptoms of menopause. There are a few, lucky few that escape mm -hmm. without any yep. serious symptom, mm -hmm. but there's just a few. Mm -hmm. And there may be a few who don't need um, hormone therapy. There may be some that do not need the testosterone. The body is in balance well enough. But many women will do well to be evaluated for the need for testosterone after they've been stable on estrogen and progesterone for a few months. Okay. Do you have a, and a, again, knowing that, so two questions, but knowing that the everybody's individual, do you have a thought on an average sweet spot as far as the number is concerned? And mm -hmm. do you have a favorite method of testosterone replacement? Mm -hmm. So um, again, the sweet spot is really determined by a patient's symptoms. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, the labs are supplemental. Yeah. The information I get from the labs is supplemental. It's not on which I base my decision. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so the first thing is I will ask all the symptoms that may, may be connected to a testosterone deficiency. And if a woman doesn't have those symptoms, even if her labs show she's low, I'm not inclined to put her on testosterone because mm -hmm. we know only so much about the body. Who knows there are other factors that influence um, how our bodies respond and react. And so if somebody is not symptomatic, especially for you know specific things like testosterone, then I feel like, okay, maybe you don't need it. Mm -hmm. Unless they want to try it, there's a trial, and I'm very, very careful with that. Like I don't want to just 
prescribe a hormone because a level is low but you feel fine mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so there yeah. are women like that yeah um so i kind of hesitate from saying there's a sweet spot okay yeah. right mm -hmm. it can vary i mean mm -hmm. there are women for whom the numbers are well within range and they're like but my libido isn't where i want it to be mm -hmm. you know yeah so it really really varies mm -hmm. and my favorite uh, way is uh dermally through the skin I am not a fan of pellets. Okay. Why? Um, two reasons. One, it is always an incision, and that's how they're inserted in the body. Yep. And I'm concerned about repeat ex uh, incisions in the body. Mm -hmm. They can, you know, if somebody's not careful, there can be infection. Mm -hmm. There could be problems, cellulitis, things like that. And the other is you get a big bolus right when you get it, yep. and then it kind of trails off. Mm -hmm. I like a steady state. Mm -hmm. And so with the application that you're doing every day, yes, it's a bit of a thing to stay on top of because you have to apply it every day, but you are maintaining a steady state much better mm -hmm. than you can do with a pellet. That makes sense, and I would imagine you're, you're more able to track your own symptoms so it gives me control over my body if, yeah. if w whatever i'm experiencing i can increase or decrease depending upon mm -hmm. what i'm experiencing right so, yeah. exactly yeah yes you can that's mm -hmm. great very good well this has been such a fascinating topic i'm so grateful that you joined us thank you so much for being here and all of your big brain stuff i love big brains so good <laughs> Thank so, you. Is you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I, I just wanted to say it was a lovely conversation. I enjoyed the free flowing conversation. Yeah. Good. I'm glad. That's the way I like it. I like it informative and easy and as you know, as fun as we can make it for talking about, you know, aging. So aging's good. It means we're still here. Okay. <laughs> well, so. aging is happening. It is happening. Yes. So we yeah. can choose how we want to see it. Agreed. Agreed. So I want to make sure that people know how to find you, where to find you, if there's anything special that people should know about you. I know that you have a really cool quiz on your mm -hmm. website. You also have an ebook, yes? Mm -hmm. Correct? I have, uh, I have, yes. There is, um, this is a, I think it's like a few pages on um, midlife challenges and how to navigate them, yeah. Wonderful, very good. Um, and where can people find you? So my website is arunamed.com, A-R-U-N-A-M-E-D.com. And I am at hello at arunamed.com. I love it. Thank you again. So good. So good. Love to have you on again uh, just to continue the conversation. But this was really, it's fascinating and it's so important because, uh, like you said, we, we it is happening. It's going to happen. And you know, we can fight it or we can embrace it. And that's really what it's all about. There's so much more to life than to worry about the little things, right? And so we just do the best we can to keep going and inform ourselves, educate ourselves, find the people who can guide us and help us. And that's what it's about. So, um, which is my favorite, one of my favorite things about this show is bringing on people who are truly here to serve. They have a story, they serve from their heart and they give and that's what you're doing. And so thank you for, for that and for all that you're doing. Um, of course, you can find me, Taste Life Nutrition, uh, the website, and then all the social media. Uh, you can go to the website. You can fill out a, an assessment that will come straight to me. We'll chat a little bit about what's going on, see if I can be of service or if I know somebody who can. So uh, feel free to fill that out. And then we're here every Thursday, 10 a.m. Mountain Time, streaming live on KUHSDenver.com. Uh, the best station in the world as far as I'm concerned. We're growing and we're having a ton of fun and we're bringing on some really cool people. So uh, join us, let us know if you have questions, if you have topics that you want us to discuss, then we're happy to do that. Other than that, we'll see you next week. Thanks everybody.